Okay, if we could take our seats for one last time. Once again, the ushers are going down the aisles if you have questions. I know such a guy in Boston who's just like that. He's a, he's a MIT professor who decided to retire early. He doesn't have any evidence in anyone's book. Boston is all over the place. And I think we're ready to go. Okay. Who would like to start on the panel? Dr. Hayflick? Uh, <coughs> yes, I was intrigued by your. Uh, oh, I need to put this on. I was intrigued by your observation, and I think you said it was supported by Dr. Selko that if we all lived long enough, we would probably or possibly all acquire Alzheimer's disease. Well, by the same line of reasoning, we, if we lived long enough, we also would acquire cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer. And the good news is that by having Alzheimer's disease, you wouldn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> I think the authority that I uh, mentioned in that case was Ron Peterson at the Mayo. I actually think Dennis would have a, a different view of that. Um, I, I, th I think the point I was trying to make was building on the point that Jay was making in response to his questions to Cynthia. Language is important. And uh, whether we label something a disease or not has tremendous ramifications as to how you approach it. Uh, so I am just trying to ask us to keep an open mind and uh, about uh, this, this continu what I can think of as a continuum of brain aging and uh, the, the challenges of labeling parts of that continuum. So I, I, that was just a reflection on what you said, not an answer to a question, but I, I you know, continue the dialogue with, with, with Dennis. I think he has a comment, too. Sure. Dr. Selko? Thank you. Um, well, I, I, as an aside, I personally don't think that everyone would develop the condition we call Alzheimer's if they lived long enough. So that would be my, my position. But some feel differently. Um, I think what Peter did so beautifully is uh, what apparently uh, from my experience at the Nobel Conference, it's an N of one, uh, you love to do around here, which it, it is to make people think. And he clearly made me think, uh, and he made a number of points, a great many points in a short time that are provocative, and many of which I would, I would agree with. Um, one of the things we academics do is to um, do what everyone in, in uh, the population does, and that is, uh, create some controversies or some arguments come to loggerheads. And humans love to do that. We love to do sports, we love to compete, and academics no less and perhaps more than others. But I want the general audience to recognize that um, while there are competing ideas about how to both think of the term Alzheimer's and the entity and how to treat it and solve it, there's enough brain power and person power to do all of this. Probably there aren't quite enough dollars and we do compete over dollars on occasion, that is, all of us. But my point is this, that the emphasis that Peter put on the importance of the humanistic impulse in us all to help our fellow man and woman with Alzheimer's disease is enormously important. And people like myself who are steeped in the biology uh, recognize, even though we sometimes don't come across as recognizing, that it is hard and long-winded for us to develop and offer true treatments and cures. What drives us on in the biological model, while our colleagues emphasize um, humanistic and uh, social and emotional and spiritual ways of handling the problem, are facts such as the notion that the most common cause of dementia at the Boston City Hospital in 1900 uh, was not Alzheimer's disease. It was not even hardening of the arteries in the true sense, that is, multiple small strokes, but it was neurosyphilis. And many people uh, had and died of neurosyphilis. We hardly ever, if ever, in our careers see a case 
of dementia due to that. And that gives me hope as a biologist because we know the folks who are behind getting rid of neurosyphilis, the folks who invented and developed antibiotics. So my point is this, that there very much is room, even though sometimes in academic circles we love to uh, put the gloves on a bit, there's room for multiple approaches at once. And happily, they are going on at once. Those of us who are convinced that biological treatments indeed uh, as Peter pointed out, uh, small molecular structures, pills, very often made in our capitalistic society in the nonprofit sector. We believe that the examples of neurosyphilis and in even atherosclerotic dementia, which has gone down over time because of treatment with statin drugs and antihypertensives, this model is worth pursuing. But it is by no means the only model, and we biologists need all the help we can get. Peter? Uh, Dennis, I, I, I think syphilis is a, is a good example, although it is an example where the etiology is uh, a specific agent. And uh, I think when you come across age-related diseases, you run into these complexities of the fact that you're dealing with an organism at a, at a different uh, stage of life and where the overlap in pathology makes the challenge all the greater. So I, 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 we, we need to take the challenge up at a number of different levels, including biological, absolutely right. I think the point I was trying to make too is that this is not just a scientific issue. Uh, how we address age-related cognitive uh, challenges, how we think about this is, is not just a job for the scientists. You really can't wait for us to come up with the labels. You need to think about uh, how we label uh, illnesses in our society. Uh, I just give the example, since you gave an example, homosexuality. I mean, that's a, that's a label we've changed our, our attitude about. Psychiatrists used to try to cure homosexuality, and, and now our attitudes are, are, uh, are quite different. So uh, you're part of this process, not just the scientists and the doctors. Laura? You're, you're a paradigm buster, I guess, um, and really are shaking up my view of, of how I thought about aging and, and cognitive aging and disease. And it reminded me of a, um, a couple that I met years ago when I had done a neuropsychological workup on a husband and then met with him and his wife. And I was, it, it was clear to me that this man was demented and I was giving them feedback about the test and largely talking to the wife. And um, she, they, this was a couple that was very poor, not a lot of education, and, and she listened to me for a minute and then she got quite angry that, that I was insulting her husband. And she said, you know, he's worked hard all of his life, and if he doesn't want to think anymore, he doesn't have to. <laughs> I'm going to take care of him. <laughs> and it did make me realize, I mean, I really was taken aback, because I'm thinking she's going to be devastated. And she was just like, hey, honey, you got problems. I don't have any problems with this man, you know. And, um, and so, and I'm listening to this talk, and I was thinking of her again, and how much emphasis we put on cognitive functioning and in, 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 in the society in which we, we, we live. But, but then it leads me to, what do we do? I mean, so I'm, I'm really interested and intrigued by the argument, but does it mean we shouldn't try to find a cure? To try, and if you're going to try to find a cure, then you have to say what something is and delineate it and, and um, operationalize it. So I'm, what, what's in your mind, what's the, how do these things get resolved? It's a matter of priorities and approaches. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a biology. You can, you can uh, imagine and, uh, uh, affecting the biology regardless of what we call, call it. But to have called it Alzheimer's disease clearly has attracted more money and attention. And to offer the opportunity for cures creates hopes and, and, and expectations. When I was on the National Alzheimer's Advisory Panel, it was always very easy to attend to the needs of biology because many people don't understand biology. And these group of experts would say, sure, half a, a billion dollars more for research. We never got quite biological research. We never got that much more. But then when it came to kind of improving care and the healthcare system, and if you had a billion dollars, which in healthcare is not even that much <laughs> amount of money, what do you do with that? Uh, so I, I think it does, uh, it does uh, convert to where we spend our dollars, how much money we put into different approaches. And uh, frankly, in my own view, and I'm a geriatrician, I'm a gerontologist, I'm a person who's growing older, I think we run the risk in this society, and I'm going to get lynched or thrown off the stage, of putting too much resources 
into older folks. And the fact that we are not vaccinating kids and not educating kids, and uh, we, have, we should attend to everybody in society, but there's a big picture out here. Yes, uh, one quick question. I really enjoyed the presentation, insightful as always. I want to take off on one very small point that you made in your presentation. Uh, and I'm just curious, what do you think of scientists who transform themselves into entrepreneurs in order to sell interventions to the public to treat diseases associated with aging or aging itself? I celebrate entrepreneurial behavior. I mean, I think that's, you know, one never wants to speak against uh, somebody with uh, an idea that they want to take uh, and, uh, and help people. I do think that we need to know when people have those kinds of relationships. In the 20 years that I have, 25 years I've been in my career, we went from uh, you, were, you were suspect if you had a relationship with a company to you're kind of not part of the group if you don't have your own uh, company. And I, I, I look to Dennis as a, as a role model for me in the sense that he did develop his own company. He, he, told, he shared us with that. Uh, and, and, I, and I respect him for that. And if we get uh, a vaccine for uh, Alzheimer's disease out of this, Dennis uh, will deserve an enormous amount of credit, and in our society, will deserve uh, the financial rewards that he reaps. And I have no problem with that. I think the problem, and you see it in the anti-aging medicine, when the science isn't there, and the entrepreneurial behavior is not associated with uh, high standards of ethical behavior, disclosure about uh, relationships, and Dennis did exactly that, then I am concerned. I think that, that the money in our society in general and I won't share my political persuasions, and particularly money in medicine uh, is, is a, a really a, a, a big problem for us uh, as, as a profession, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of conflict of interest. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies would have you believe uh, that you know, there is a magic bullet for everything. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're learning that we, we don't hear, I just wrote an editorial on the fact that we don't hear about negative studies, we only hear about the positive studies, that, uh, that uh, uh, this data is suppressed, that language is manipulated. Um, so I think our, our multinational pharmaceutical companies have some work to do to, to regain our trust. Dr. Salko, um, again, I do concur with what Peter said, and the, the problem with the biopharmaceutical industry is that they don't always uh, follow the uh, kinds of logic and the kinds of goals that would be most useful for the population and for our patients. They follow the bottom line, and that's, uh, for better or worse, the way that our capitalistic system is made up. Where they are enormously useful, if we indeed make sure we're on the watch to control uh, their impulses, our impulses, because uh, a great many people are investors and are involved in private enterprise for drug discovery, they're enormously useful for things that academia will simply not do. The alternative to biopharmaceutical companies would be to have more of a national or international institute that would have its a concrete responsibility for developing uh, treatments of various sorts, vaccines, medications, etc. That largely hasn't arisen because the national institutes and our academic institutions are for generating new knowledge. But the process of making a drug or making a vaccine is partly new knowledge, but partly a repetitive process that requires a great deal of iteration. And so we need to struggle with how do we get that part of the work done and the way our society has currently solved it is by allowing people to invest in the iterative process of trying to find drugs. Um, it's not necessarily the best way to go, and I firmly believe that we have to keep controls on that process. We can't just let it run by itself. And the whole movement to disclose uh, conflicts of interest is a great one. It certainly wasn't one when you and I were young neurologists. It's become more and more common. There are many fora, many journals that still don't require it, and I de indeed they should. Here's a question from the audience here. 
You obviously feel that patients with Alzheimer's disease benefit from staying involved in the community. Is there any data that suggests that this process slows down the development of the disease? The, one of the, to just build on the comment that, that we were talking about, the pharmaceutical industry, there's a lot of money to do studies on pills. Uh, it's not hard to get a study. Uh, it's really hard to do uh, studies of complex social interventions. I mean, we hope to do that in the intergenerational um, uh, school with some of our programs. And there is some evidence, uh, uh, and Laura might be able to comment more. For example, Linda Freed, who's the head of geriatrics at Hopkins, has evidence that volunteering in school helps the physical and cognitive health of older adults, but those are not folks that have any memory problems. So I would say there is no evidence-based health uh, uh, information about that. However, I would say this also. If somebody is actively engaged in the community and if they're doing uh, things that are meaningful to them, uh, the chances that they would actually get the label of Alzheimer's disease are probably pretty small. So if you, if you want to convince your doctor that you don't have Alzheimer's disease, go out there and be functional and be active in the community. It's kind of a, a silly answer to the question, but uh, there isn't, to, to be serious, that we don't have any randomized control study that would suggest that this, uh, that this uh, actually helps prevent Alzheimer's disease. Here's another kind of practical question. As a medical caregiver, I've experienced many people being left alone in nursing homes. The patient gets no visitors because, in quotes, they can't understand if we visit or not. They get abandoned. How can we address this? I think the first thing I would say is um, don't uh, underestimate that they know of your presence uh, even if they don't seem to uh, recognize you. Uh, try singing them a song. Try playing a piece of music. Try touch. Try aromatherapy. There's actually some evidence-based uh, medicine on aromatherapy that's come out recently. Uh, so. Um, you can be in relationship with people with more than just, just verbally. Uh, so try those things. But clearly there is a point at which somebody is at a point where they're uh, gone beyond. Um, but I'll tell you, I sure wouldn't want to make a misjudgment about when that point had occurred. Keep up that relationship as best you can. Can I quickly add yes, something sure. to that? There is some evidence that even moderately demented people can recognize the emotional face of, faces of others. So they may not understand the verbal content, but it looks like people can see if someone's angry or sad. And I think it's really important to remember that because when somebody doesn't appear to understand you, it's easy to then start to look a certain way. And um, it appears that people may well understand. And just to elaborate on that, the, the worst thing you hear, for people even with mild dementia, and Dennis has heard this story as well, is uh, the doctor from the word go uh, ignores the person with the Alzheimer's disease. The, 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 the doctor uh, mistreats their own patient, addresses all their comments to the caregiver, and, and, and doesn't recognize the presence of somebody with the label Alzheimer's disease. So this issue of, of, of distorting relationships uh, can occur very early on, even with the person that is responsible for that healing relationship. Okay, well, one last question here. Knowing what you know about aging and senescence, have any of you, it's all of you on the panel here, uh, consciously changed anything in your life based on that knowledge? <laughs> Who wants to fess up here? Well, I, I'll just say quickly, I already got my chance. My wife and I started the intergenerational... I have a buck, can I pass it? <laughs> pass it down. Whoever wants to answer gets the buck. You get <laughs> Look, I think it's what your mother said. Healthy diet, mental and physical exercise. Clearly, my wife and I got involved in this school because we felt that was something that would give us a sense of purpose and uh, who knows, uh, maybe, maybe it will contribute in a small way. So I'm, uh, I, I try to listen to what the experts like my mother say. Good advice for all of us. One comment, yes, um, like that is that I often tell uh, folks who come in who have uh, what some of us call Alzheimerophobia. Uh, that is, they are very concerned that they either have or are about to develop Alzheimer's disease, and they're often the children 
uh, of Alzheimer victims. Uh, so that there's good reason, for, good justification for it. But often when they're tested carefully, there's no objective evidence that they have Alzheimer's or even mild cognitive impairment. So I usually tell them, you know, if you're worried that your memory is slipping and you just can't keep things going the way you used to, just take away about 5% of what you do during the course of the day, or even 2%, just slow down a little bit. And when they come back to me, some of them tell me, four, five, six months later, that seemed to work. I don't feel as nervous that I'm developing Alzheimer's. The one person I've met who never pays attention to that message is me. <laughs> Jay? Actually, I, I think that uh, question that was asked is a very fair question. I mean, here we are, researchers in the field of aging, and somebody wants to know, what are you doing? Or what are you doing any differently than anyone else? And I, I actually, I think we need to be answering those kinds of questions. I'll, and I'll tell you my answer. I, I, uh, I do, I do not take any vitamins. I do not take any minerals. I know there are plenty of people who pop pills uh, like crazy. I don't do any of those things. I, I'll be honest with you, I actually didn't personally know how I felt about aging until after I wrote it down in our book. And then I discovered the importance of the randomness to the aging process, something I really wasn't quite aware of before, but once I recognized the randomness to the aging process, I suddenly realized that, that how long I lived, as much as I would like to live long enough to see my you know, grandchildren and contribute to their reproductive success by sending them checks, um, <laughs> as much as I would like to do that, uh, what I realized is, not, is that how long I live is not all that important, and what's really important is, is how healthy I am and how good I feel during the time that I'm alive. So I do spend a lot of time exercising because it feels good. I'm very careful not to overwork my joints. Uh, I'm 50 years old, a little bit older than my wife. Um, and I, um, but I don't take any vitamins and minerals and I really just exercise and have a diet based on moderation. And it's as, it's as simple as that. Dr. Hayflick. Where's that dollar? Yeah, right, you get the dollar. <laughs> well, I think the fact that none of us have come up with some kind of uh, formula or lifestyle change or uh, intake of some kind of drug or vitamin, the fact that we have none of us have suggested that we're doing that is the answer to your question. And that is that, and I, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm speaking for everybody here, but I, I hope I'll be corrected if I'm not, and that is that we, we simply don't know of any intervention that will slow, stop, and certainly not reverse the aging process. But what we do know is that there are many things that you can do, and Dr. Olshansky mentioned exercise and diet, many things that we can do to delay, postpone, or prevent pathology or disease. And that's the distinction. Wait, can I make one more point? Dr. Olshansky, go ahead. Actually, I was just reminded of one extremely important point that uh, Dr. Hayflick just reminded me of. If Cynthia is right, and there's a gene, or a gatekeeper gene, or a couple of genes, I think we're in trouble. And the reason is, is that we would then have to identify that gene and modify it. And in all likelihood, if we attempt to modify a single gatekeeper gene that's going to have some cascading effect on something that we call longevity, in all likelihood, it's going to have an effect on something else that perhaps we may not like. The good news is, believe it or not, I think what many of us have been trying to say, and that is, is that aging isn't pro is not programmed. And in the absence of an aging program, interventions that influence the manifestations of aging work. That's why we can increase muscle mass at the age of 100 through exercise. That's why mental exercises can help at any age. Because aging isn't programmed, we can intervene at any age to improve quality of life. And I think that is the important point uh, to be made. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 
One of the emails I got this summer, uh, this was from the, the people from California who were apologizing for not being able to attend here today. They said the reason that they liked to come here, their favorite thing, was the Q&As because they liked to think that they were sitting in an eavesdropping on intelligent conversation. <laughs> and uh, I, I think they're absolutely right. I, I, when we put this, this conference together, what we hope to do is to give the general public out there an idea of what the field of gerontology is like, uh, who's in it, how they think, and what they do. It's a very broad and varied field. I think you've discovered that. I think you discovered they don't always agree either, but I think they did a marvelous job of telling us about it. Stand up and take a bow.